All right. Well, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I usually say evening because we had been meeting in the evenings, but uh, we're going to try out this a little earlier. So we may see some folks coming in because sometimes it can be kind of hard to tear yourself away from the work at the end of the day in the afternoon. But um, thank you all for joining. And uh, my name is Kevin Gollinghorst. I'm the geospatial director here at T-Rex. And, uh, you know, again, last month, if you were here, you knew it was Valentine's Day, right? So we had a lunchtime event. Um, that definitely drew people, right? Because it's free lunch. <laughs> but thank you, Kathleen and others, for helping with the drinks and food. So help yourself there. Uh, we continue to look for interesting, pertinent speakers to help us all know more about our community and our world. And while organizations and topics may have varying levels of direct connection to the geospatial focus, uh, we all know that everything is connected to a place, right? Or location information. So um, we look forward to hearing more tonight from Urban Ecosystem and uh, Urban Eco Block, excuse me. What's look, ecosystem? Yeah, we're talking about ecosystem, talking about sustainability. Um, and so, but in general, we're gonna continue to have different speakers, different organizations represent each month on the second Wednesday. And we'll continue to mix things up with different nonprofits, academia, industry, government related topics um, that will be represented. But at four o'clock now, so tell your friends. And we had a lot of people respond to say, yep, four o'clock's great. And then, you know, we'll see, life, life gets in the way. <laughs> um, so I did want to also mention T-Rex does send out a monthly newsletter, so if you're not getting that, uh, please see myself, Kathleen, Noah, one of the staff here, let us know and we'll get you added to that uh, to get events on the, on the radar onto your calendars. And then again, I'd like to encourage you to follow us on uh, social media platforms, LinkedIn, X, Facebook and Instagram, right, so you can kind of follow the news there. And I will remind you at the end too, but uh, just a reminder, tomorrow night will be another event here at T-Rex, same location, um, for Agritech Thursday. And so if that interests you or you wanna learn more there, uh, we'll be right back here. Now that one will be still at 5.30, so a little bit later at the end of the day. So with that, I'm gonna, gonna be turning it over to Steve O'Rourke and Dan Helmuth and potentially Bobby Bonner. And then, do you have any emails here from Urban Ecoblog or the two of you? Okay. okay. All right, well, I could probably give some background on, on each of them. I'll let you do that. I'll let you highlight any background you have. Uh, but we look forward to hearing um, you know, what you've been up to and uh, what you share tonight. And then, of course, we want to encourage folks to ask any questions that you may have. Would you prefer they wait to the end or throughout uh, the presentation? No, no, I just jump, jump on in. Kind of yeah. you don't need to make them hold okay. Huh. All right. If we'll they start getting barrage, well, we're going to get to that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> hold up. Hold up. Only, only nice questions. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for being here, and we look forward to your remarks. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming over to listen to this in the afternoon. It's all, it's a, as you're going to hear from Steve's going to do most of the presentation, um, but it's a lot to kind of cram in in um, 45 minutes or so. And we do encourage questions because it's a, it's a little bit of a complicated concept all, you know, to be dumped on all at once. And um, so we look forward to some questions. And maybe if you ask a question, you might be nice to introduce you, um, yourself as to what your background is just so we get an idea of it. But um, f feel free to unload any, anything you anything you want to know we'll try to answer Tell it about yourself okay I, um, I'm, I'm an architect here in town uh, we do a lot of we have a small business Helmuth and Bigness Architects and we do a lot we've worked on about 60 lead projects and about maybe a dozen living building challenge projects and we started a nonprofit for urban eco block to sort of set up a, a zoning planning model to do what we're going to show you about what about seven years ago I think at so, and it's complicated, and we found that out to be complicated ourselves, so it's taken some time, but we're just now getting some good traction. So l looking forward to your input and questions. Cool. I'm Steve O'Rourke. Um, I've been on the, uh, this, the Urban Eco Block Board since like 2016. I think we were founded in 2015. Uh, so it has been a long, a long push. Um, I, uh, I have a consulting business called Inner Guidance, as in energy guidance. Uh, helping commercial building owners uh, better understand and manage their energy use. I'm a uh, NABCEP certified PV technical sales specialist. I, I, uh, NABCEP is the North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioners. Um, so my real focus is on energy and uh, as the director of energy and efficiency for, for Urban Eco Block, um, I, I'm passionate about net zero energy and we're gonna talk a little bit about that as part of the presentation. Um, so, we can go ahead and um, jump right in here. Um, so when we talk about the eco block, 
So the city block is just this fundamental element of, of, of how the city is built up. Uh, you know, the defining pattern, if you will, of, of how we do things. Um, here's what's going on in a lot, of our, a lot of our cities these days. Here's Detroit, Gary, Indiana, New Orleans, good old St. Louis. So as cities seek to reinvent themselves, we've got a lot of new unique opportunities here to incorporate ecological, social, and economic systems into the redevelopment patterns. And that's really what we want to focus on at the Urban Eco Block. So our mission statement, um, I, can't, I can't remember how many hours we worked on trying to distill a mission statement down into this, but it's reimagining that urban block as an ecological, social, and economic unit to facilitate equity, efficiency, and democracy. A lot of words in there, but kind of cram it all in to really spell out what we're focused on. So here's kind of an overview. Um, you know, the, the, the big piece here is revitalizing that abandoned urban core. Uh, uh, we've got this form-based code um, that is designed to promote mixed use, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, a fundamental element of this is this common center design. So most blocks have that, an alleyway uh, that everybody's got their backyards to. We're focused, we're, we're turning that into, we, the, the, the idea here is to turn that into common ground, where you have a playground and a park, a community garden. And so it's less about backyards and more about community. Diversity is really important. Ethnic, racial, age, income. We really want to celebrate diversity and promote diversity in the neighborhood in these, in these urban eco blocks. Um, net zero energy and water. Um, we're really blessed with, with plentiful water here, but we want to maintain all the water that we bring on site uh, and, um, and handle our storm water. Um, essentially, we're, we're trying to create a walkable, livable neighborhood where you can work and play and, and, and spend your time in the, in, the, in the community, ultimately for a happier and healthier living. So here are some of the design principles. We've got, you know, we'll talk about the urban design, um, health, uh, is, a, is a big element. Um, uh, landscape, social equity is, is probably the most challenging piece of this. Um, the water, the energy, transportation, and then resilience. How can we um, uh, maintain uh, in, in, uh, in difficult times? So the urban design is the, big, the first piece of this. Um, we've got mixed use um, of different densities. So you won't just see, a, you know, all just single family homes or all duplexes. This would be some apartments, some single family homes, some commercial, retail. Um, it would certainly be zoned, but, but um, uh, a little more variety within the block. Um, and again, I talked about designing this around a common area rather than an alley. Um, this op this is, provides an opportunity for social interaction with the residents. Um, and, and we can do a little more to share amenities so everybody doesn't have to have a ladder, for example. You know, we've got some common areas where we can check things out, uh, you know, if you will, have an app that says, hey, uh, I need to borrow this particular thing, and everybody doesn't have to have their own stuff. Public health, so we want to create a walkable, bikeable neighborhood where people don't have to drive all the time. Um, to encourage exercise. Um, having a community garden where we're growing healthy, organic food uh, in the gardens right there on the property. Um, encouraging outdoor work and play in, in, the, uh, in the green spaces. A big piece of this is teaching people about the toxicity that we live in and, and creating agreements in the community that we're not gonna use toxic elements in cleaning and managing our home and properties. And last, create places for rest and complementation. Um, you know, it might be a reflection pond or, or a labyrinth or space for outdoor yoga, or meditation, things like that. The landscape, um, you know, certainly we're talking about um, urban agriculture. Uh, you know, community gardens and, and the common areas that enable residents to connect with the source of their food. You know, that encourages healthier eating, it provides economic savings, 
and it reduces shipping costs. Um, the edible plants are functional and attractive landscaping options. Native plants create habitat and improve biodiversity. And because they're well adapted for our climate, they're, they're drought tolerant and require little watering. Um, xeriscaping is just using more with, with, with stone, things that don't need water. Uh, and then also this provides shade and evaporative cooling. Social equity is the big piece here. This is a key to engage, the, the key that we're focused on is engaging existing community members to be, you know, right up front to get involved and to talk about what they're looking for. We want to minimize the outside direction and educate and inspire residents to naturally embrace sustainability. We want to introduce the diversity that I talked about, the mixed income and socioeconomic status. We want to limit this to about 10 or 20 percent low income, affordable housing. You know, we want to, we want to have the haves and the have-nots be sharing, um, be sharing this block together. The ethnic and racial diversity, we want to welcome refugees and populations that would contribute to and benefit from the eco blocks. Oop. How did I go there? And then the covenants. Um, I, I mentioned um, coming up with covenants to protect the cooperative mission, to maintain and improve the beauty and the functionality of the commons, and to provide a roadmap for processing conflicts in the hands of skillful and elected leaders. So basically, this is internal democracy. Um, we talked about the net zero water. Um, what we really want to do is everything that comes onto our, our land is to keep it on the land. So we'll have detention basins where we're recharging groundwater supplies. Um, we've got 100% of the water captured precipitation from a closed loop water system. We'll have potable water, we'll have gray water, and we'll have the wastewater system. Energy is, is another piece that um, is technically challenging, um, but doable here. Um, there's key, the keys to net zero energy is efficiency, conservation, and renewables. Um, so the first thing we want to do is optimize our building envelope to minimize heat transfer. So we don't need a whole lot of space conditioning. That's your biggest use of energy. Um, and then also the natural ventilation and lighting. Um, high efficiency LED lighting and controls, um, for space conditioning, we want to leverage economies of scale with a district-level geothermal heating and cooling system with smart controls, so a block-level uh, uh, geothermal system. We'd have a solar-based microgrid, uh, which is with, that has a bio, maybe a biofuel-based generator uh, and a battery storage in for energy independence and, and economic benefits. And then dashboards to measure how much energy we're using and monitor production, energy production and usage. So, you know, it, this, this will be kind of an interesting social experience, experiment um, when we're trying to um, minimize our energy usage, uh, to try to be use, using conservation principles. And so the, the, there's a notion that maybe what we do is start publicizing how much energy everybody uses. Huh? Yeah. It, 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 you know, this is just, this is something that residents would have to agree to, but basically, it's like, how little energy can you use? You know, we, we, we are prone to just waste energy, and, and that's the biggest challenge. Um, transportation, uh, by having this walkable, bikeable neighborhood, we want to reduce the need for personal transportation. Um, make this sort of car optional, and these days, particularly with younger people, they're not necessarily interested in owning a car. Um, you know, if you need to, if you need, you can, we can have shareable uh, electric cars, uh, uh, electric bikes, um, so you can get around as you need to. And if you need to go somewhere else, you can, you can Uber or whatever, but you don't necessarily have to have your own car. Um, we would have a central garage, so every, every property doesn't need their own garage. Um, and so ideal locations would be, you know, around job centers, around public transportation, bike routes, and within walking and biking distance of other retail and community services. 
Um, some of the things that we might um, have within the block, you know, might be child care or elder care or health clinics, other services where you can just walk to it. And the last thing on here is resilience. So we're talking about having a passive design to minimize the need for artificial lighting and, and space conditioning. Um, have a, a, a high performing building envelope like insulated concrete forms and SIP panels that can withstand earthquakes also. Um, we have locally stored and sourced water and a microgrid for backup power and in storm shelters for community support. So we've been working with the city of St. Louis, the, their, uh, their planning and urban design agency under Don Rowe's direction for years now. Um, and the city has agreed to create a planned unit development for this, uh, this, this model eco code that we've developed. Um, and what this essentially does, it allows developers sort of a pre-approved code that they can build to. So this model E code is, a, is this form-based code that's got standards related to block development, building envelope, the building development, architectural street set, streetscape, and sustainability. All those are documented in this model E code. And this is really kind of our intellectual property. Um, we, are, we share it fairly freely, but this is what we have brought to the table. So the city asked us, um, they were kind of like, what is this going to look like? Could you all do a sketch up? So we got a grant and, 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 and hired somebody to actually do, um, a, a, put together a case study. Um, and we picked this, the Academy neighborhood. Um, this is, and this is just a sample block. We're not planning to do anything here, although we have engaged the, with the Academy neighborhood, Academy Sherman Park. They are interested in doing this, not necessarily on this block, though. Uh, we just picked this because it's got a high degree of vacancy already, vacant land. Um, uh, so this is just, this is King's Highway over here on the, on the east side. And this is a couple blocks north of Del Mar. So it's, it's in, in right on the south and Kensington um, on the north and then Academy over on the west side. The first thing is to go out and, and look and see what kind of buildings can we salvage? What, what properties can we renovate, rehab um, to bring them up to a performance standard that, that some of the new buildings are close to? Um, so this is sort of what's left you know, uh, uh, when we go in here. So then with the traditional alley and the backyards are gonna be replaced with the common area um, with different access zones. So you see the different, the different ways that you can get in. Um, and then that common area can include, hey, there he is. He's been upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby Bonner is another one of our board members. Um, so anyway, this common area can really include whatever we want. You know, typically it's gonna have uh, the community garden, a playground, open spaces, you know, designed to collect and, and harvest the rainwater. Um, uh, it'll also have sort of be designed to, to um, create some flow with the other neighborhoods, the surrounding blocks. Here's sort of another view of some apartments that would be over on, over on Academy. And you notice the, 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 the roofs are single plane, optimized for solar. So what we actually did, um, all these buildings being optimized, uh, try to maximize the amount of solar on the roofs. Then we've also got larger commercial spaces over on the over on the east side next to King's Highway and some of these other, uh, some of the flat roofs where we have ballasted arrays. Um, and then we've got, in the, in the middle, we've got shade structures and canopies that are functional, like a shade structure over the, over the playground, um, over maybe over tennis courts or, or you know, pickleball courts or whatever, um, but they provide both shade and shelter. Uh, and then like above the parking garage, uh, can I see that? Here's our parking garage here, and so this would be like, this could be a uh, walkout 
you had a green roof with, with picnic tables and here canopies over the tables and stuff. Just things like that where you're actually creating function around the solar, the solar canopies. And then on the existing buildings, they're not necessarily very well oriented for solar, well designed for solar, but we will put up there what we can. Then the other thing we talked about was the block scale geothermal system, the ground source heating and cooling. And so it, the existing homes may or may not connect to it, uh, but they would have that opportunity to. Um, so this is, um, would be zoned and, and um, uh, we've actually got a, a geothermal uh, consulting firm that's working on, we've, we've put together a whole load profile for the neighborhood for this, this sample neighborhood to see how much geothermal we would need, how many, how many tons of, uh, of heating and cooling. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then the retail and commercial areas over on Kings Highway, you know, that would be where we have the car and the bike sharing and things like that. Um, maker spaces, there might be, you know, studio apartments above uh, along with the, the maker spaces. So then we, we also did, we worked with the students over at WashU, uh, their design studio, and, and they put together um, a study on, the, um, on a block right next to the NGA West. So this is actually uh, at the corner, uh, this is Jefferson running, running here, Jefferson and Cass, and here is the, uh, the, uh, the small hospital that was built for the NGA area. Um, Anyway, the, uh, the students learned a lot about, you know, how to, how to develop a, you know, create an eco block, and they learned a lot about what it takes to be net zero energy. That it, you know, you can't do three or four stories and be net zero energy if you're trying to harvest energy just on the rooftops. Uh, so that, I, I should have, here's the overlay that they did. And then here is actually, they, they each created a, a model of, uh, of the building that they designed. We're working with uh, Kingsway Development um, up in the, the, uh, the Upper West Side um, in the Vernon Triangle. Um, and they're working with, with uh, Itner and trying to pull together and leverage some Kate Trivers, I'm sorry, thank you. Um, uh, trying to leverage some of the built, some of the design principles that the Urban Eco Block promotes. We've been working w around the city. We've got Bobby is uh, has got a project up in up in uh, the north side of JVL and down in the southern part. We had um, did a study in Old North. Um, I mentioned the Vernon Triangle, and we we're uh, we're talking to the folks over in the academy. Um, so a lot going on, um, and. Uh, trying to get some traction on, you know, the, the finances and, and the, the, the social piece of this and um, trying to educate people about sustainable development. So that's really it in kind of a uh, high level, you know, um, uh, that's the urban eco block. Uh, let's talk questions now. So I'm going to kick it off with a quick comment, and then I'll ask Bobby to do a quick intro for your background and uh, how long you've been involved with the, the group here. Uh, okay. Oh, and Don, you're welcome to come up if you'd like. Um, but while you're coming up, I will just say that the idea of uh, knowing what other people spend on their energy, I think it's something that could be explored more. And the example I'll give is uh, at our military installations, many of them that has old buildings, but over time as they've been either upgraded or new housing has been added to military installations, one technique that was used was uh, with new meters, you could monitor usage. And there was a threshold that if you were, you know, a moderate user, um, you know, your, your utilities were paid for. If you actually use less and tried to, you know, be very conservative, you could get a refund each month, potentially. I don't know how many people got, it may be extreme case. Or if you really use a lot of energy, you may have to be prepared to pay a little more, which may help people to think about it. And so, like, I would just envision in this community, maybe sometimes just knowing, like, my usage, 
you know, I'm paying for it, but how does it factor in? How does it compare to others? It may help you to think about your usage. Um, so I just want to add that as an idea, as a, something to consider whether or not that would change people's patterns. Usually the pocketbook changes most of it. You don't know how much energy they're using. You know, I mean, it, 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 do, how many people know how many kilowatt hours they use in a, in a year or a month, you know? Most people, if you see your utility bill, you just see the dollar signs. We we've done a lot of stuff with we call it dorm wars where you do you have um you have metered usage in student dormitories and then they they play games to see who can save the most energy as sort of a positive way of doing it rather than energy shaming. It. <laughs> But there are lots of ways to you know make people aware of it, and then also incentivize people to um, you know to reduce it. Yeah, I think I just think most people have no visibility and no understanding of, of how much they're using, and they see their bill at the end of the month, and they have no idea where and when did they use that energy. You know, how much was it was the electric? How much was like I, I it was amazing how much a dehumidifier uses. You know, it's it's like a, an air conditioner. Yeah. Um, and so we were running that, air, that dehumidifier down in the basement, and it's like, wow. Um, so helping people understand um, how much it costs to do things, they can start making decisions about what they do. So. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Bobby Bonner. I'm a board member, and I'm the director of community revitalization. So that's why you see me around the city in everybody's neighborhood all the time, talking and um, trying to bring the community together uh, to focus on the revitalization, not only of the six neighborhoods, but St. Louis. Uh, I think St. Louis itself is going through a revitalization period. Um, and so I've been focused on this. I guess uh, I grew up in Jeff Vandeloup. I've been learning construction since I was five years old. My dad had a construction company as well as being a St. Louis fireman. So all the tools were in our house in the basement. So they, those were my toys. I didn't get Christmas toys. I got, I got to go play with the, the power tools that drove my mother crazy because my five-year-old kid is down and running this big power saw. I mean, he's going to come up here with no head, you know, type stuff. But I learned a lot. So. St. Louis was, revitalizing St. Louis was always one of my goals since we moved out of Jim Vandaloo. And I said one day I was gonna come back and build a city at Jeff Vandaloo. Uh, I was about 10, 11 years old at that time. Um, before I was 12, I went through the process of renovating two full houses uh, with my dad. We went through plumbing, electrical, HVC, as well as the carpentry, so I got to understand that process. Um, over the last 20 years, I've been in Chicago, um, working and developing in Chicago. Actually started the Green Movement in Chicago in 1995. Um, I sat on the uh, AIA Committee on the Environment, and that's where we started at. We had a mayor that bought into it really quickly, uh, Mayor Daly, and so it, there was no Push back on green in Chicago. So yeah, so we was forced once we opened our mouths, but <laughs> in sustainability, we didn't get um, any traction until Vice President Al Gore came online uh, talking about uh, the sustainability and global warming, and that's how we got more traction and we got ahead of everything. Uh, but. The project in, in Jeff Vandaloo uh, is one of my projects. Uh, we have a three block radius that I've picked out to start developing. There's 25 homes, there's 40 LRA vacant lots in that, just in that quarter alone. So we've picked out those 40, but we want to develop 25 to start, and we're going to start with three so we can show the technology and our ability to get it done. So. Uh, we're hoping to start that as soon as somebody put money in our bank accounts 
or invest in a project uh, as a $12 million project. Um, Five million of that would be the construction. I think uh, we put 1.7 on solar and the other 1.3 on geothermal in the system. So that's where we are now. Uh, my background, like I say, runs over years and it's been part of developing. And just want to see St. Louis grow. Just want to see the, the neighborhoods in North St. Louis um, come up to the standards because I plan on moving in one of those houses I'm developing. So I'll see the house, I'll live there from the ground up. So uh, just wanna thank you all for coming and viewing our presentation and hope you will um, be part of the urban eco block and the growth of St. Louis. Just, just out of curiosity, anybody know how many empty lots there are in St. Louis? Just to, and I probably won't get the, the number right but it's over 20,000. So two thirds of the city is empty. I mean, and it, it, it's a sin. I mean, if, if, if you were looking at another country and you saw that two thirds of an urban, urban area was empty, you'd think, what's wrong with society? And there are loads of reasons. I mean, there's racial reasons, there's economic reasons, there's technical reasons, there's, you know, all kinds of social reasons, but but most people don't even think about it or even know it. I mean, it's like New Orleans. When New Orleans flooded, people didn't realize the poverty that existed in New Orleans. It took, it took a hurricane to kind of show the world what was really going on. So it's just it's an eye opener. And, and let, I want to let Don Logue introduce himself. Sure. So um, I'm the oldest person up here. <laughs> Age, uh, ageism is a big issue these days. But uh, as I came in and was sitting listening, um, 45 years ago, I was responsible for uh, leading land use planning and the redevelopment of downtown Springfield, Illinois. And we did a 65 block TIF, which essentially saved that area from literally burning to the ground. And while it still struggles today because of the challenges that economic forces uh, bring to bear, uh, we do have the Abraham Lincoln Library and Museum, and, uh, and still a, a substantial uh, uh, place for making. And we do have a, apartments with uh, 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 geothermal uh, uh, working on a multifamily basis up there. So, but the reason I bring that up is that, and as Steve talked about the economics, and I was on a, 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 and on a meeting on Nottingham, England this morning. And economics played a major role there. And the challenge is, how do we become a smart city? Okay. And you do that with effective planning, using the best and the brightest, and in particular, our technology, so that we are investing in the, effectively in the future. And there are a lot of economic issues underlying all the things that we're talking about here, and a lot of institutions that are reluctant to change and to recognize and talk about those economics um, honestly. So part of our job is to provide the leadership, the insight of how we can bring this technology together to, uh, to create communities that work, and that we all want to live and work and have fun and raise families in. So it's a big challenge. We got a lot of work to do here in St. Louis, but uh, that's what we're about, so. Questions? questions. Yeah, I've got a comment and a question, so. So as far as a comment, um, right along uh, the, the lines that Kevin was uh, mentioning, uh, you know, have you focused at all on like military installations or at least going to Capitol Hill and preaching exactly what kind of savings and things that would, you know, take place if they did that on military installations? Because to me, I see a, a huge benefit because, you know, a lot of the bases and things that I've visited, they're getting dilapidated, they're starting to go out, age, things like that. So if there's a more efficient way, there might be an opportunity, especially with, with like Build Back Better and some of the other funding that's come through. Uh, and then the second thing I was gonna mention, have you done a cost difference uh, or, you know, 
cost benefit analysis between uh, like if you had to build you know that entire city block uh, with the normal standards of today like they would do and compared it to if I built this one invested 12, 12 million dollars what kind of potential development savings and or you know sustainable sustainability savings that we would have yeah those are tough questions <laughs> Um, and as far as the uh, renovation of existing historic homes, it is a little bit of a challenge, especially the historic um, state historic preservation office only allows you to insulate two and a half inches of your exterior, which is just ridiculous. But there are ways to to bring an older home up, you know, with new building envelope, with new you know attic insulation, different different techniques to make them much more efficient. They're not going to be as efficient as a new home. Um, and then you know the the new buildings we would propose we would we and we've targeted in this example of a very of a low EUI. I don't know if you know familiar with the energy use intensity. That's the the amount of energy used per square foot per year in a given area. So we've we can we can get those down by easily 50, 60, 70 percent over a conventional home, and we've at, we've actually modeled that. We I, as an architect, I know that all this costs more. By, you know, by its very definition. And one of the things we've tried with a, with a central geothermal loop, um, and we're working on that at the moment to see, because geothermal systems are much more expensive than conventional forced air, um, but we have an economy of scale by doing that on the block level. So that's one thing. Another thing on the, um, on the solar thermal, or I mean the solar photovoltaic, take, which Steve could speak better to, that can be done by a third party. It can be done by Ameren. It could be done by a third party, you know, community solar um, concept where they provide the solar and they they get the, the fees from the different people using it. So that comes off the table. But as far as a complete comparison, a pro forma of what we're doing, that's what we're, we're looking for some avid um, financial people to, to help us do that because that's at, the, that's at the point, that's one of the biggest questions and it's one of the, you know, one of the biggest challenges we're, we do face.